I love French. I studied French all through school. I never took any other language but French. So this is this is going to be an experience for me. I'm Jay Fidel on Think Tech, and we're talking about community matters. And we're talking with uh, Louis Bousquet, who is um, chair of the French. I get that right, chair of the French department at UH Manoa. Yeah, that's good. Okay, good enough, eh? <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, we are so delighted to have him. And I'll tell you the background. I had an argument with my brother and we were trying to figure out who was the one in the 19th century that wrote all this dark poetry. And I said to my brother, no, it's La Rouge Foucault. My brother said, no, you're wrong. It's not La Rouge Foucault, it's Charles Baudelaire. And he was right. And I remembered in college when I studied, uh, I studied under a really wonderful French teacher. Uh, we, we studied Charles Baudelaire a lot. Uh, however, it's been a long time, so I thought I'd refresh on that with you, Lewis. Um, and I want to find out more about Charles than I knew before. I want to find out about his dark poetry. I want to find out how it, it's relevant or interesting in our, in our time here in COVID, here in a world which seems to be, mm, you know, um, dissembling in front of us. Uh, so uh, is he a good person to study, Lewis? I was afraid that you were asking me if he was a good person, which would have been a, a very American question to ask. Uh, a, a good person to, to study, for sure. Uh, he's a very uh, interesting character. He's a, he's a tragic figure, like most of us uh, French artists from the 19th century. Uh, he died rather young. He was um, around like uh, 46, I think, and uh, he died of syphilis. You know, it's not a, it's not a good death. So uh, and his and his work is uh, uh, you know surprisingly enough uh, very modern. Uh, he's uh, very appreciated. Actually, he's the I think uh, the, the the most appreciated 19th century uh, French poet uh, today. So he's very relevant, and uh, I think yes, uh, he's a, he's a very interesting guy to 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 learn about. Well, you know, the thing about it is, and I remember this from school way back when, is that he was dark, he was into drugs, he was into all the depression things, and, and um, I have a recollection that his syphilis, um, you know, gave him dementia. I guess it does that. Um, and so he was not really cogent there at the end, in his late 40s. Um, but he wrote about these dark things, and I, and I looked him up, and um, uh, he talking about sex, death, lesbianism, I don't think that's too dark now, um, metamorphosis, whatever that is, depression, urban corruption. You know, we're talking about the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, because they had one in, in France too, the loss of innocence, alcohol, drugs, what a life. I mean, it doesn't sound like things were working out really well. For, and he had trouble with his family too, I remember that. Um, so where does that put him on the scale of romantics? Well, to tell you enough about me, Jay, you know, uh, yes, uh, that's a, uh, that's a, uh, where does he put, I mean, you know, it's not so dark, actually, you know, if you look at it uh, from a, from a modern standpoint, is, is, you know, actually, I think what makes him so, so modern and uh, that uh, every, every uh, aspects that you just described it uh, succinctly is, uh, is very much what, uh, what a, a modern human being has to, has to face today, you know, uh, a drug is uh, is prevalent in our society. Uh, sex seems to be an obsession. Uh, we are all a bit depressed. We have to face uh, this uh, post-industrial world in which we don't really, uh, you know, know what to do or to survive. Uh, uh, you talk about lesbianism and everything. Those are human experience. I mean, you know, he's a, he's a, I don't, what makes it dark is that he died uh, rather young and he had this disease. But uh, let's say that he was healthy. Uh, he would be, a, you know, a, a great contemporary poet. You know, he would be someone that he could have his series on Netflix, and everybody would love it. You know, you know, it strikes me that what all this is really saying is that he was, he understood, you know, the reality of his time, which, which, you know, it's not so great. This is around the time of Les Misérables. Yeah, it was things mm. were not particularly stable in France. He lived in Paris. You mentioned, um, so that maybe he was really being honest. And is the honesty yeah. is the honesty big part of this for him? Yes, yes, I think that's that you 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 struck a an important uh, uh, part of his work and his persona. It was like he was uh, indeed 
uh, uh, a true artist in the sense, like maybe in the modern sense, that he's someone that really uh, uh, expressed without trying to hide anything and without hiding behind his art, his art was expressing uh, his experience and what it what it meant to be uh, a young man and then a, a later an older man the, in a, in a big metropolis like Paris in the midst of, of the of the 19th century, which was a, a very uh, uh, transforming time. You know, it's a France just uh, a change uh, its its regime. You know, uh, 50 years prior to that, uh, there used to be a king that was ruling and a, a society that was rather uh, protected uh, we, we have today this very dark uh, vision of uh, you know aristocratic uh, times but the reality was that the, 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 the there was a pact between the, the king and the aristocrat and the the, the the common people and the pact was that the king was supposed to protect the people uh, if you know did, did he do it you know it's up to to, to discussion but what no happens bless, no bless the, oh, no bless oblige no Noblesse oblige, exactement, exactement. And the problem was that the noblesse uh, kind of stopped to oblige, you know, people started to become uh, less interested in their duties and maybe more uh, in the pursuit of their own pleasure. But at the end, the 19th century is a century where uh, the common people uh, is abundant, you know, he has to fend for himself and there is no more a superpower, a superstructure to protect that person. And so from Baudelaire's standpoint, we're looking at uh, a, 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 a person that lives in the city. He's not a peasant, he, he doesn't like nature, he bores nature. But uh, from his standpoint, you know, to be a, a man in the city is, a, is a, in the 19th century, is to be thrown in a chaotic world without much uh, order. Uh, it's a time there's a, a, a bunch of revolution taking place. France is looking for, for a stable regime, so it oscillates between uh, monarchies, right, to come back, and then the Republic, and then there is the Second Empire. So, you know, Baudelaire is kind of, of, of stuck uh, in, in these troubled times, he even participate into a, 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 a short-lived revolution. Uh, and uh, he gave us all those uh, images, those slides, uh, like a, like a pen, painter with, with words, uh, talking about uh, his experience, uh, the experience of a, of a human being in a, in, a, in a big city and in a rather modern big city because Paris is transforming very fast. And in some ways, we could say that uh, Paris stopped transforming at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, eventually, you know, everything remains the same. There's no more space that people don't build much. But towards the mid uh, 19th century and the end of 19th century, it's the time where Paris structure itself, Haussmann started to, to build like big uh, avenue and so on. And so, and so Baudelaire is a, is a witness to that. And uh, he gives us a, a, a very intimate a perspective, a very, uh, uh, I mean, I like the word, but the honest perspective, if you will, like a perspective that where he really shares what the tribulation that he's facing, and also uh, uh, a disenchanted perspective, because he's, that's maybe another aspect of why Baudelaire is so uh, interesting today and maybe so uh, appreciated, because. Baudelaire is a very much uh, translated into modern times. He's very much the figure of a of a loser. Uh, he's a, he's a pathetic figure. Uh, he doesn't have money. Uh, he he lives on a stipend that's uh, uh, is given to him. He, he the stipend is is controlled by a lawyer that makes sure he doesn't spend too much. So basically, he constantly has to beg for money. This is his he family. Doesn't... His family was tightening the purse strings on him. Yeah. Yeah, he lost his father. Uh, he had a very interesting father that was a, a, an artist and a, a man that came from from the the, the you'll say a blue collar man if, if if the term apply. But uh, and the father, his father died when he was six years old, and his mother that was a, a thirty years younger than the father. The father was in his sixties. His mother remarried, and she remarried with a with a military man, and uh, there was a bit of a, a psychology called a. a shock for the for the young Baudelaire that were never able to live up to the, the the discipline and the expectation of that new father and eventually the father sent him away he had a, a short trip he went to the Indian Ocean we're not sure if he, if he went to India but he went to uh, what's today uh, La Réunion to, to, to French island and uh, when he came back basically uh, 
he started to spend his inheritance from his father and he spent so lavishly that his uh, his new father his stepfather decided to 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 take the money away from him and uh, to use a, a lawyer that was in charge of uh, of uh, you know controlling the money so basically for the rest of his life because he refused to work and he decided that he wanted to 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 write for a living he never made a cent uh, out of out of his writing he, he had to beg for money and and he was thus uh, tied to a life of uh, of humiliation and uh, and a pathetic life you know because he didn't have any any power whatsoever why does this remind me of Lobo M? Uh, although it wasn't exactly in the same time it does it's living in a garret. It's uh, having uh, friends around you. Hopefully Baudelaire had friends um, uh, who you shared your art with uh, and you suffered through the cold winters. I mean, is it, do we have another La Boheme in Baudelaire? You know, La Boheme is a, is a I will say it's a, it's a bourgeois uh, uh, concept. You know, it's a, this romantic idea of the, of the artist, you know, that, that lives with a, with nothing and survives uh, thanks to the help of his friends and uh, this this is a, a, a very uh, can I say you know uh, uh, it's a nice perspective for the reality that was much more more, more drab but yes indeed he was living a, a kind of a bohemian life and uh, he, he, the the aesthetic aspect of this life never uh, escaped him he was he was perfectly aware of the fact that. He took pride in not, uh, you could say, selling out, in always refusing to uh, follow the bourgeois path, which would have been simple for him. He could have started to work, uh, you know, for 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 anyone and and have a little uh, little bit of money. But no, yes, he he, he lived like most of his uh, of his contemporary, and you're right, he had plenty of friends. He lived uh, like them, you know, with with very little little money, and uh, you know, mostly. Uh, Spending time with uh, prostitutes, you know, because it was the it was a time when there was no just uh, you know a relationship like that between men and women. You know, uh, you were either married or or you were not uh, you know you, you were not uh, available, so to speak. So yeah. basically, he lived this kind of life for sure. Yes. Before we go forward, I want to go. I want to go into the thing about the French Revolution. He was born in the 1820s there. Mm -hmm. And by the time he was, um, you know, a teenager thinking about things, uh, it wasn't even 50 years since the revolution had taken place. And I yes. know from my own experience that there's a strain in French uh, culture and French uh, social perception, historical perception, that looks back, as you were talking about the noblesse oblige, looks back at before the revolution with a kind of nostalgia. Um, those were the good old days. And I'm sure that people in the 1830s and 40s and 50s, it wasn't that much later than the French Revolution. Uh, some of them anyway, maybe many of them, were looking back with nostalgia at the French Revolution. Where do you think that enters in his thought? Was, was he a modern person having rejected the monarchy or did he have a kind of nostalgia for it? I mean, uh, I'm, the monarchy. I'm not sure. I don't think that he was uh, he was regretting the time of privileges and and so on. I think like he he, he positioned himself. I mean, Baudelaire is considered as this, uh, if not romantic, you know, this this uh, you know dramatic uh, um, aesthetic persona. You know, that was always looking for beautiful things and for a unique perspective. So in this sense, he's a romantic. And romanticism is very much this nostalgia for a time of uh, great ideals that were, you know, given to the, 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 uh, the you know, the, there is this whole reinvention in the 19th century of the Middle Age. You know, they start to dream about the Middle Age. You think about, you know, behind me, there is this gargoyle. The gargoyle were added by Violet Le Duc. Yeah? There was uh, not any gargoyle on Notre Dame de Paris, but Violet Le Duc added those gargoyles because he felt that they looked medieval. You know, <laughs> so in some ways, uh, 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 Baudelaire is the same. He he, uh, he 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 has this ideal of a time where you know a great uh, uh, ideas and and feelings and sentiments existed, and you find that in his poetry. Uh, they, they are. It's, it's where he it doesn't look so modern. Uh, there is a, a very strong uh, a, a feeling of the past and of an idealized past 
that seem today uh, a, a little bit uh, old fashioned, if not, uh, you know, completely antiquated. Uh, but uh, what what pervade that perspective is the fact because there are a bunch of, of, of artists uh, that, that that wrote uh, in this kind of tone and their poetry today is absolutely impossible to read. It sounds ridiculous. But what's very strong about Baudelaire is that he brings this uh, this failure, this corrupted element to it. And this corrupted element is very much, you know, this, this idea that we are f all fallen from Eden, that we don't understand what's taking place and we cannot hide behind great words or great ideals anymore because they don't uh, they don't work uh, you, you can understand that through his, his relation uh, uh, to uh, religion uh, and God uh, he was very much a Catholic in the old sense of the terms he was afraid of hell and he had a very strong sense of guilt uh, he talks about sins and he talks about corruption and everything but it is not a uh, superficial perspective it is not just an ideological perspective because he brings it to his uh, his own metaphysical experience the fact that he encounters the world the world he has desire he has fears uh he he, he suffers and he puts everything in perspective uh through this uh, this uh, this language this uh this romantic language that talks about God, that talks about the demons, that talk about the flesh and so on. But this is very modern from this perspective because it's it's our perspective. He's, he's aware that religion is not everything and the corruption is everywhere in, in, in Catholicism. He's aware that uh, we cannot hide behind God anymore because God is nowhere to be found. He's, uh, the man, uh, human beings are left alone. Uh, and you know the, the, the political system is, is of no help either. So in some ways, you know, it, it, it pushes this, this uh, difficult, this humiliated experience to the, to the brink until he died, basically, because he finished his life in absolutely pathetic manner. He, he went to, to Belgium to try to find an editor because he couldn't find anyone to edit his poetry. And Belgium at the time was a hotbed for uh, 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 contrefaçon, meaning like people that were editing uh, uh, work that didn't belong to them. Uh, so he went to Belgium and he couldn't find anyone to edit him. And he eventually died. Uh, I mean, he didn't die in Belgium, but he had some uh, some stroke in Belgium and uh, he had to be brought back to Paris and he died like a few months later. Mm -hmm. So everything has a meaning in the sense that he really paid with his own uh, 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 suffering and his own life for all those ideals, those uh, nostalgic, uh, antiquated ideals. So I, what I get, among other things, from um, from that description is that probably had very strong feelings, um, uh, very strong emotions, and he was. Uh, tell me if I'm right about this. That he was introspective. Uh, he was able to analyze those emotions. He was able to analyze them so he could write about them. Um, oh, yeah, extremely. A passionate, extremely. a passionate man. No? So passionate. I guess, you know, it, it, it comes with the territory, so to speak, you know, like poetry, you need to exalt your passion, you know, in order to get something uh, of interest. But yes, he was extremely uh, a critic. He was uh, innately critic. He looked at, at his own life and at the world uh, surrounding him with a very piercing eye, with a very intelligent eye. Uh, and it is through the, the art of poetry that he was able to, to uh, uh, find a path, to, to, plow, for, to plow forward. Because what's very interesting about, about uh, Baudelaire's uh, work is that there is no real books. I mean, he, he really published one uh, 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 book, it's The Flower of Evil, and he, he's been working and reworking it until the end of his life. So uh, his work is, a, is an ongoing uh, struggle uh, for meaning, for to try to understand the world. But at the same time, he's, if he uses his, uh, his rational sense, uh, he's very much a poet. So uh, the, 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 the picture, the slides, the vignette that he takes are uh, 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 impressions and impressions that have to, do, to deal with uh, emotions, uh, uh, the senses, you know, the, 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 the smell is very important. Like when he, when he smells something, suddenly he sees a lot of images that are that are coming to his mind. Uh, when he hears certain certain music, certain sound, 
uh, obviously when he sees things and then he transcribes that into into poetry but but you're right he had a very very clear uh, a piercing eye and, and a very strong intelligence uh he was almost like a you know like most of those great artists you know they are like a a god ruling over their own universe and not, nothing escaped their gaze you know he has this this very strong strong uh, 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 view and perspective uh, that said Lewis, i i i really wonder uh, if we could put him hypothetically zola esquise put him hypothetically in the present time and and let him in you know examine covid with us uh, let him examine all these things that are happening that are existential threats. Uh, how would he fare? Would he find a, a resonance, a self-pity in that? Uh, would he find the same kind of, um, you know, a strong passion dealing with these risks and threats? How would he behave himself? How would he think? I mean, it's hard to say, but, uh, you know, the way what we can, we can, we can say is that, uh, he he, did, he never uh, shied away from the, the pain, uh, the decaying body. You know, he has a very strong uh, fascination. He, he has a, a, a fantastic poetry called Ayun Charogne, where uh, he goes uh, for a walk on the countryside with a, a woman, and uh, they encounter a, a corpse that's in, in the process of decaying, filled up with maggots. And he looks at it in detail. Uh, and he describes it and at the end he turns his gaze towards the, the woman that he loves and he says to her what's incredible about that is that that's what you're going to turn into uh, your, your beautiful face is going to turn into a skull eaten uh, away by the maggots so to go back to the covid i'm sure that uh, you know uh, he would have heard about the, dis the terrible description descriptions about people you know choking to death and uh, being uh, unconscious and uh, i'm sure that he would have brought those images and potentially connecting them with, uh, you know, other uh, classical images of uh, hell and uh, eternal damnation and so on. Yes, there is, there is, there is no question about that. Oh wow, very interesting, very interesting. So um, I, I wanted to uh, look look uh, down down into the into the, the generations of poets in the latter part of the nineteenth century. My understanding is, uh, and you mentioned this. Um, is that Baudelaire had a big effect on French poetry, I suppose, and, and French literature. He, he influenced a lot of French poetry for years to come. Can you talk about that? Who, who were the people who followed him? I followed it, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, there is something about Baudelaire is that he's, he's by uh, no means he can be characterized as, as the, the leader of a certain uh, way of writing or the type of poetry. After Baudelaire, uh, no more, uh, you, you find almost no poets writing like Baudelaire. I mean, Baudelaire has a style, uh, a, a so-called classical style that stops with him. He was already, I would say, pushing it. You know, people don't write like that anymore. The time has changed, you know, and you were talking about Zola. There is this, this desire to kind of uh, 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 get closer to reality and in some way, you know, find words that were more common than all this uh, very, uh, you know, adorn. Uh, uh, very poetic terms. I mean, you could find, you could make the case, you know, there is some movements that are close to that. But uh, so if we look for people, I think, you know, uh, surprisingly enough, I think if there is an artist that is uh, uh, the most influenced by Baudelaire in some ways, it won't be a poet, but it will be a, a writer and it will be Marcel Proust. Marcel Proust at the, the beginning of the 20th century, you, you know that he was this, this absolutely uh, fantastic uh, uh, artist that uh, try in his in his own way, you know, to understand what uh, the, the human experience uh, meant, and uh, it was all about the the, the memories. And uh, actually, you know, there's a very strong uh, olfactive uh, sensual aspect. You know, you remember host with the Madeleine. You know, he, he, he smells the Madeleine. You remember his mother. Madeleine, yeah, yeah, the recherche de Dom Perdue, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So Proust talks about Baudelaire, and and Proust is very very impressed by Baudelaire. Uh, Proust has a as this idea that uh, Baudelaire is very much a, a pathfinder and, and, and he, ha he is a key to understand modernity. Uh, the other author I'm thinking is the philosopher, German philosopher, uh, Walter ben Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin. That Walter Benjamin really uh, talked a lot about Baudelaire and uh, he is the one that said that uh, what was most surprising about Baudelaire was the fact that his work didn't get old at all. 
uh, that he was so modern uh, in spite of everything when most of the, the poets of the time had completely disappeared and were almost impossible to read that Baudelaire was so was so modern and, and, and so and so such a classic. Yeah, that's so that's so interesting. And I guess the lesson there would be is you, you can't judge somebody by the way people react to his work during his lifetime. Sometimes it takes dozens of years, dozens of decades before people appreciate the value in that. Um, and that's the most rejoicing part about it, you know, like it's, it's in some ways, you know, it's the revenge of the losers, you know, the people we look <laughs> down upon today are going to be the, the great of tomorrow and the other one are going to be completely forgotten. <laughs> so is Baudelaire uh, uh, treated as a great French poet? Oh, today for sure. There is still a little bit of snobism, but there's always snobism in French, uh, in French uh, uh, society and in the circle of, uh, uh, for literary circles. But I think today, uh, without any discussion, he's, he's considered as the, as the greatest 19th century poet. Oh, wow. So the, the last thing I wanted to do with you, Louis, is um, I, I pulled out, um, it, this is in English, I don't know if you have the French. Um, it's uh, one of the poems of um, uh, the, the evil flowers, uh, Fle Fleur de Mal, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, even the term Fleur de Mal gives you a smell, doesn't it? Evil has a smell. A special. <laughs> it's just like Proust, you know, nostalgia and breakfast has a petit madeleine. Um, in this case, evil has a smell. So I'll, I'll read a, in English now. Uh, and I'd like, I'd like your comment about how, how this works. What kind of prose, what kind of poetry are we talking about here? What's the quality of his writing, the quality of his choice of words and all that? Uh, regrettably, this is English. Folly, depravity, greed, Mortal sin invade our souls and rack our flesh. We feed our gentle guilt, gracious regrets that breed like vermin, glutting on foul beggar's skin. Our sins are stubborn, our repentance faint. We take a handsome price for our confession, happy once more to wallow in transgression, thinking vile tears will cleanse us of all taint. It goes on like that, quite a quite a ways. It goes on like that. I mean, it's not the kind of thing you're going to make into a musical. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. That could that could be done, you know. There's this, <laughs> you you find his 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 taste. I mean, he's he's very dramatic, and and you find his his taste for the the, the corruption of of the flesh, and in some way, in certain uh, complacency towards this 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 spectacle, you know. But there is this very strong, also strong, uh, redeeming message. You know, the religious message. You know, is is all the image that it is through through sin and then through uh, uh, decay that you can find the light. You can find some kind of truth, and there is some redeeming qualities to it. I mean, if you if you look at today's world, uh, you know, we we always have this uh, almost. Uh, 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 stereotypical stories uh, from person that uh, fell very deep, that fell into drugs and and uh, you know uh, procrastination and uh, and f seeing a lot of uh, women and suddenly you know they saw the light and they were able to clean themselves out almost miraculously you know and that's that's basically that poetry you know there is something redeeming in our fallen condition. Ah, that is that is really that is it. There's something redeeming in fallen in our fallen condition. But he never redeemed himself, did he? Uh, sadly enough, he didn't. But that was not his, his, his purpose. You know, his purpose was to, to write beautiful uh, poetry and he, and he more than succeeded in that. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting to look through the eyes of a poet to see the world because in all of us, uh, you can correct me on this, but in all of us, there is a poet. In all of us, of there is someone who can be introspective and see the world differently. Uh, like Baudelaire or Proust, um, and who can examine every detail and be be uh, so um, uh, oriented toward detail that we have a, another reality around us, a better reality, a deeper reality. Um, and so, um, gee whiz, are people studying Baudelaire these days, Louis? Yes, they are. They are. They are still studying Baudelaire for sure. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a. I won't say that it's they are like huge, uh, you know, group of people doing it. But yes, of course, you find you find very uh, vibrant uh, both their studies in, in in France and in the francophone world. Well, we should have that in Manoa too, you know. 
Uh, so who knows, after this uh, video, after this uh, talk show, maybe they'll be lining up at the door there in the French department. Uh, I'm sure they will. Miles around to, to find out more about Baudelaire. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, well, we'll, we'll, give you, we'll give you a call there. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Louis. I really appreciate You're this discussion. And I hope we can do it again, uh, maybe with Marcel Proust, if you like. <laughs> okay, yes, yeah, whenever you want, Jay. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Louis Bousquet um, in the French department at UH Manoa, helping us understand maybe something uh, that we should, we should be conscious of in today's complex and sometimes depressing world. Aloha. Yes.